I must tell you that I'm a little afraid of these radio mics. Ever since I was in Australia, speaking in the Olympic Stadium there, which is a huge place, and they gave me one of these radio mics, and it didn't work at all well. So I asked them for another one, and they gave me a very rare radio mic. They said, this is the only one of this kind in the whole of Australia. It's the latest Japanese model. <laughs> and it should work perfectly. And it did. But what they didn't know and what I didn't know was that it was tuned to the wavelength of the Victoria State Police. <laughs> and for the next hour, the entire state police force got nothing in their police cars but this guy preaching. <laughs> And they sent out two radio detector vans with revolving aerials on the roof to find out where the illegal broadcast was coming from. And towards the end of my sermon, I noticed the police began to come in at the back. And I thought, we must have a criminal hiding among us, <laughs> little dreaming that they were going to arrest me at the end. But they were very decent. They said to the man at the door, how much longer is this guy going on? And they said, well, maybe another 10 minutes. And they said, well, we've heard the rest. We might as well hear the lot. <laughs> so whenever I get one of these things, I always begin with a greeting to the police. <laughs> so if any police are listening, God bless you in your work. <laughs> well, now, it's many years since I went to Liverpool to speak there. And at the end of uh, the meeting, a rather surprising thing happened. A young man came up to me. He had a Moican hair do. He had a chain through his cheek, and he had a Nazi war jacket on with swastikas. And he took this jacket off, and he pushed it into my hand. And he said, take that away. He said, Jesus told me tonight he doesn't like the image. And then he turned and walked away, and I was left holding this Nazi <laughs> war jacket. And I kicked myself. I thought, I'll bet that's his only jacket. I wished I'd given him some money for a decent jacket, but he'd gone. That young man had been led to the Lord by the man sitting over here. And he went to his church and brought his pals in off the street and turned your church upside down, didn't he? <laughs> and a young boy called Julian. And apparently he went home with Joel and they shared jackets on the way home. Well, now, I was telling another congregation in Sheffield about this, and I suddenly got a funny feeling. You know, if you tell a story about someone and they're sitting in the audience, it's a bit embarrassing. I got that funny feeling. I said, is Julian here? And there was silence. And then a little lady stood up at the back. She said, no, but his mother is. <laughs> and uh, I said, you're Julian's mother. What's he doing now? She said... He's on the gospel ship Anastasis, sailing around the world for Jesus. And I've just heard the last news we've got is that he's preaching to the Eskimos in Greenland. <laughs> and it all began in Liverpool with that Nazi war jacket. So it's good to meet up with Joel again. I, I didn't. Did we meet up that night? Yes, we did. We did. Right. Well, I've forgotten, but he hasn't. Right. Well, now I'll tell you what we're going to do. I want to take you back to basics. That was the title I actually gave Joel for the publicity, but he thought that you'd all think I'm a conservative if I gave you that uh, <laughs> title, so he wouldn't use it. But I want to take you right back to Bible basics, as if you'd never heard the Easter story before. The trouble is, when you've heard it many times, you get too used to it. And I want to take you right back to the facts on which your faith is based. Our faith is not based on feelings. Right. If it was, your faith would suffer every Monday morning. It doesn't matter what your feelings are. Your faith isn't based on your feelings. And it's not based on fairy tales or fantasy. It's based on hard facts. And it is so important that you hold on to those facts yes. if you want to go on being saved. Because you know you can lose your salvation if you don't hold on to the basic facts on which your faith is based. I want to read a few verses from the Bible at this point which say just that and tell you what the facts really are. 
I won't tell you where it comes from because I'd like you to listen to me reading it. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, those are the three facts, and if you hold on to them firmly, never let them go, then you will go on being saved, because I'm not saved yet, I'm being saved, I'm on the way, and God hasn't finished with me yet, and I'm not fully saved until my character is perfect, and I'm just like Jesus, then I'm saved. Until then, I'm being saved. And a friend of mine has a shaving mirror, and on the bottom of the mirror it says, God hasn't finished with me yet. So he looks at that face every morning and realizes there's more to being saved. My wife has tremendous faith, but there is one thing I preach that she finds great difficulty in believing. Comes to the very edge of doubt about this one thing in my preaching. And it's when I preach that one day her husband will be perfect. (laughs) And she tells me if she based her faith on experience, she couldn't believe it. (laughs) But by firmly basing her faith on the word of God and the facts, she can just believe it. But then I have to believe that one day my wife will be perfect. That stretches my faith too. So we both need our faith stretching. Well now, what I'm going to do, I want to speak this morning about how Jesus died. As if you didn't know. As if you'd never heard. I want to tell you the story of how, because he was born at that time and in that place, it was inevitable that he would be murdered. Had he been born at another time and another place, he might have lived through to old age and had a long and useful life helping other people. But because he was born at that particular time and in that place and among those people, it was inevitable that he would not die of old age. But I want you to get the facts and get them clear. Fact number one, Jesus did not die on a Friday. I know we remember his death on a Friday and we call this Good Friday. Originally it was called God's Friday. But then people didn't like the word God so they changed it to good. Just like they changed the greeting, God be with ye, to goodbye. And so people want God out of the picture but they still want good in it. So it's called Good Friday instead of God's Friday now. But Jesus didn't die on a Friday. And another shock for you. I mentioned both of these things last Sunday morning on Premier Radio. How many of you are here because you heard Premier Radio last Sunday? Anybody? One, two, three, four, five, quite a handful. Good. Right, well, I mentioned the other fact. The cross did not kill Jesus. He didn't die of crucifixion. Anybody nailed to a cross would survive at least two days and up to seven days A cross cannot kill in six hours. And so we must get back to the facts and find out when Jesus died, how he died, what he died of, and make sure that we know what really happened because it's only as we hang on to the facts that our faith will remain strong and see us through until we're fully saved. Now considering that Jesus was the most famous person who ever lived, we know astonishingly little about his life. We know a lot about his birth. That story is told around the world every December. But from then on, there's a blank. 
And for the first 30 years of his life, we know hardly anything at all. The curtain lifts just to give us a little glimpse of Jesus at the age of 12, and then the curtain falls again until he's 30. So for a very famous person to know next to nothing about the first 30 years of his life is astonishing. And then suddenly at the age of 30, he strides onto the public stage and begins the work that made him famous. You may be interested to know that we have many other records outside the Bible that refer to Jesus. That tells us it's not a made-up story for a start. But people are surprised that so many other historians, so many other people of the time knew about Jesus and wrote about him. And they all agreed on one fact. And the fact was he was a miracle worker. That he had the most extraordinary powers. Every record we have, outside the Bible as well as inside, tells us that Jesus had these amazing powers. And I want to emphasize that he only used them for good purposes. He could have used them for other purposes. He could have killed people with those powers, but he didn't. He killed a fig tree, and that was the worst thing he ever did with his power. He never used it against people. He will use it against people, and when he comes back the second time, we're told that the first thing he will do will be to kill thousands of people, an entire army. And the same way he killed the fig tree, he'll kill them with his word, with the sword of his tongue. He just cursed a fig tree and it was dead the next day. All the leaves were on the ground. That's what he's going to do to a big army. But when he was here the first time, he used those amazing powers entirely to help people. He used those powers to feed the hungry, to help the blind to see, to help the deaf to hear, to help the lame to walk, and even the dead to come back to life. Yes. He never used his power in a negative way against a single person. And yet... Within three years, he was dead. All he'd done was go about doing good. And even his enemies had to admit he was a good man. He challenged them, which of you can find a fault in me, either in his character or his conduct? None of them could. He is a good man going about doing good for just three years and they kill him. Now that takes a lot of explaining and I want to show you this morning why it was inevitable that a good man doing nothing but good would be killed at that time and in that place. I doubt if it would happen here. I dare say it could happen if Jesus was born today in Northern Ireland or in Kosovo or in Sudan, or in many other places in the world where there is already big trouble. It was precisely because he was born into a place of big trouble that it was inevitable that this would happen to him. In fact, somebody just a hundred years or so before Christ had said, if ever a good, perfectly good man comes into the world, he'll be crucified. And he was. So I want to try and explain to you why it happened. Jesus, you know, did not die of natural causes. He didn't have a fatal accident. He certainly didn't have premature senility. He didn't suffer from disease. Yet at 33, less than half the expected lifespan of three score years and ten, he's dead. Now, of course, we know a huge amount about his death. His birth is famous, then 30 years hidden, three years in the public eye, and then his death, we know more about his death than about any other person in history. It's in absolute detail. We have eyewitnesses of how it happened. It was nothing less than judicial murder. And when we call murder judicial, we mean 
that he has been found guilty by a human court of a crime of which he was not guilty. Then it becomes judicial murder. People are trying to open, reopen the Hanratty case this week. A man who was hung for murder. And now people are saying, but he was innocent. And we must reopen the case. Somehow when the innocent suffer, there is an indignation rises in us. Over Stephen Lawrence. Over anybody who is innocent especially those who are falsely accused of crimes they have not committed. I think you understand what I mean, don't you? That's what happened to Jesus. It was an assassination, and it was the authorities, the religious and political authorities, who found him guilty of a crime that he had never committed and sentenced him to death and got him put to death. That's what we're remembering today. And we know the way he was put to death. He was not hung. He didn't have his head chopped off, which was a favorite way in those days. He wasn't shot because there were no guns in those days. How was he put to death? You know perfectly well, but do you realize what it means to be crucified? It is to have nails driven through your ankles and through your wrists. It's no use putting a nail through there. It just would tear out with the weight of your body. It has to go through there. And there's a little hole in the middle of the bones of your wrist. And if you can get a nail through that hole, you can hang on that for days. The same goes with your ankle. Needed to get the nail in the right spot. And a man would first be stripped absolutely naked. Don't believe all the pictures of the cross you've ever seen with a nice little loincloth. A man was stripped of everything and then he was nailed wrists and ankles to a block of wood and strung up and left to die. And it took at least two days and up to seven days. Now I want to emphasize this because when I was in the Philippines I discovered they have an extraordinary way of celebrating Good Friday. They choose a man from each town to be crucified to commemorate Good Friday. I couldn't believe this when I first heard it. But the man considers it an honor. And they take the chosen man in each town and they nail him to a cross and they stand the cross up for six hours on Good Friday. And then at the end they pull the nails out and the man walks away but he will forever after have the honored nail marks. And that's how they celebrate Good Friday. It never kills. You can't kill a man in six hours just by nailing him to wood. If ever you've seen the film or read the book A Town Like, like, like Alice, an Australian novel, and in that a British soldier is nailed to a garage door and left there, but he doesn't die. And someone manages to get the nails out at the end of the day after darkness falls, and he's okay. Crucifixion can only kill over a long period. It is the slowest, most painful, most humiliating death that has ever been devised. Hanging is over in a minute. Get your head chopped off, it's over in seconds. But the cross goes on for days. And it goes on until a man's legs are too weak to support him. That's when he dies. Because as long as his legs are strong enough, he can push up and breathe. But when you're hanging by your arms alone, breathing becomes more difficult and sooner or later your lungs congest and you suffocate. And when your legs can't support you and you just hang by your hands, you suffocate within a very short time. Therefore, the only way to kill a man in hours on a cross is to break his legs. And then he'll be dead in minutes. And that's what they had to do to the two thieves who were crucified with Jesus. Because the Jews wanted them off those crosses by 6 p.m. that evening because the Jewish feast of Passover began at 6 o'clock at sunset. And they didn't want bodies hanging around. So they said, we want those bodies off the crosses by 6 p.m. 
at the very latest. So they came to the two thieves who were still very much alive. They'd only been on the cross six hours. So they broke their legs. And within minutes they suffocated. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. So the cross hadn't killed him. And we've got to ask, what, what did, what had? Because then we're going to get very near to the heart of the story. So, why is it that because Jesus was born at that time and in that place, it was pretty well inevitable that they would kill him? I've already told you it was because they were in big trouble. They were in trouble because they were in enemy-occupied territory. He was born to the Jewish people. And in just two minutes, I've got to take you through. Boy, I've got some rivals up there. I wonder if somebody can tell them there's a film for children through there. <laughs> you know, once a preacher stopped and he said to a mother, would you like to take your baby out? And the mother said, it's all right, you're not disturbing him. <laughs> so anyway, back to it. I must give you in just two minutes... 2,000 years of history of the people among whom Jesus was born. He was a Jew. He is a Jew. He always will be a Jew. And they had a history of 2,000 years from an old man who in his 80s left a brick-built home with running water and central heating and lived in a tent for the rest of his life. His name was Abraham. And that's how it began with one man. Then it became a family through his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. And the family became a tribe. I wonder if somebody could go up and catch that little boy who's running all around. Thank you so much. Became a tribe. And then they became a nation. And then they lost their freedom and became slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Moses brought them out. And I want you to notice this, that as soon as Moses was about to be born to deliver them and give them their freedom, all the baby boys were killed. And that was going to happen again as soon as Jesus was born. That should tell you something. I believe behind both events, the devil hates anybody to be born who's going to bring people freedom. Well, they got their freedom, they got their own land, Moses brought them out and Joshua brought them in. And after 1,000 years from Abraham, they had a kingdom of their own and an empire of their own under a king called David. It took them 1,000 years to get everything that God had promised to give them. And they lost it all in the next 500. And they lost it precisely because they did not live as God wanted them to live. God gave them very simple rules commandments we call them, about sex, about money, about property, about a Sabbath day, about all sorts of things. And they just ignored them. And prophet after prophet after prophet came and said, if you go on like this, you'll lose everything God has given you. It's taken you a thousand years to get it, but you'll lose it much more quickly. And 500 years later, they lost everything. Their land, their freedom, their king, all gone. It's an amazing story and it's in your Old Testament. How a thousand years they got everything God had promised. 500 years later they lost it. And they were slaves again in Babylon. But they never gave up the hope that they'd get it back again. For the next 500 years parents taught their children one day. One day we'll get it all back. And the Jews still, another 2,000 years later, still dream of getting it all back. They did get their land back. After 70 years in Babylon, they got back home, or at least some of them got back home. They got a little land back. They didn't get their king back. Because from then on, for the next 500 years, they were a colony of other empires. The Syrians came. 
then the Egyptians, then the Greeks, and the Greeks were the worst yet. They introduced all kinds of things, things to God's people that they were forbidden to do by God. They introduced sport. And still to this day, sport is the religion of men in this country because of Greece. But it's not that sport is wrong. What was wrong is that sports in Greece were in the nude. They introduced that to God's people. They introduced many other things. And the worst Greek ruler of God's people was a man called Antiochus Epiphanes who ruled them for just three and a half years. And he put statues of the Greek gods and especially Zeus, the king of the gods, in the temple of God. And he sacrificed a pig, pork, on the altar. And pigs were unclean to the Jews. And he turned the temple into a brothel and put prostitutes in all the vestries. And that man is a prefiguring of another man who will come one day called the Antichrist who will also come for three and a half years and claim to be God. That's another story. Finally, the Romans took over from the Greeks and the Romans brought peace. The famous Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was established, but it was established by force, by a strong army. They were law and order people. Have you heard that phrase before? You'll hear it again in the next election. Law and order. And they imposed law and order. And they did some pretty horrible things. And they introduced crucifixion. And in fact, there were at least 5,000 other Jews crucified under Rome. But how many of them have you heard about? When do you have a preacher talk about the other 5,000 who were crucified? You've probably never even been told that. But that's how they kept law and order. And it kept the people towing the line. Now, whenever you have a colonial situation and people are ruled by foreigners, and many of you looking around have come from precisely that situation, wherever you, your parents or grandparents lived, they were probably in a colony ruled by Britain or by France or whoever. Especially black people ruled by white people. This is exactly the situation that they had then. And the Romans were hated. And the people longed for the day when they'd get their political freedom and have their own king, a direct descendant of David, a son of David, on their own throne and they'd be free again. Now you can begin to understand the situation, can't you? Whenever a little baby boy was born in Israel, the mother and father would rush into the street and shout, Dawiz, Dawiz, David, David. And all they were doing was announcing the birth of a boy. And that wouldn't necessarily be his name. But they were saying, there's a boy born. Could this be the king? And that's how they used to announce a boy's birth. Dawid. I've got a little gold ring here with Hebrew name Dawid on it. This happens to be my name. But that's how they used to announce a boy's birth. Might be the king. And for century after century they waited and they waited and they waited for a boy to be born who would be king of the Jews and bring them their own land back. Instead of being slaves in their own land they'd be free. Martin Luther King would have made his speeches then. I have a dream. They all had this dream of freedom from the colonial powers so that they could have their own land, their own king, their own government. But when the Romans had come, they made all kinds of laws. One law was particularly hated. A Roman soldier could grab you by the collar of your jacket and say, carry all my kit one mile. And you were forced to carry the enemy's occupying soldier's kit for one mile. That was Roman law. Can you imagine how popular Jesus was when he said, carry it a second mile? 
Go two miles. See, somebody who talks like that is going to get into trouble. Real trouble. Because of the situation. Now, of course, any enemy-occupied territory leads to the division of the people occupied. And that indeed is how foreigners rule, by dividing the people. And this is what did it, and I want you to get this very clearly. When others come and take your country and rule it, that won't unite you, except in hatred of the colonial power maybe, but what it will do, it will divide you into three groups. The first group will be the terrorists, the freedom fighters, those who are willing to do anything, to go to any lengths, to go to violence, to get rid of these foreign rulers. That's the first group. We call them freedom fighters or terrorists, depending which way we look at it today. In those days, they were called zealots. But it's the same thing. It's those who say, I will fight. They had to do it secretly. And most of these secret fighters were in the north of Israel, in the mountains of Galilee. They had to be because they had to hide. And they would come out from those mountains and they would kill Roman soldiers and then run back into the mountains again. One of their leaders was called Barabbas. That's a name we'll come across later this morning. But they were zealots. And in fact, Jesus did call one of those terrorists to be one of the twelve apostles. His name was Simon the Zealot. So Jesus had one of these terrorists in among the disciples. And yet, Jesus refused to fight and wouldn't let his servants fight. When Peter cut off the ear of a Roman soldier with the sword, Jesus healed that ear and said, that's not the way we do things. So he was going to upset the zealots, the terrorists, because he wouldn't join them. The second group that always comes to the surface when there's an imperial power occupying a colony by force are the collaborators, the people who cooperate with the rulers, often to make money, good business. They don't fight for their freedom. They, if you can't lick them, join them. And I was in Warsaw in Poland a month or two back and I was in the Jewish ghetto in Warsaw where there were half a million Jews trapped inside walls in a few blocks. And one of the worst things I learned there was that the Germans, when they walled up the Jews, they still wanted money from the Jewish people. They still wanted taxes. And they advertised the job of tax collector within the Warsaw Ghetto. And the job advertisement said this, we want tax collectors and each tax collector will be given a quota of so much money that he must collect within the ghetto. We won't pay him, but whatever else he can squeeze out of the people goes into his own pocket. And if anybody refuses to pay, report them to us and we'll bring them out and shoot them. And so Jews applied for the job of tax collectors for the Germans. And provided they handed over the monthly quota, they were free to charge whatever they thought they could get out of people's pockets and put the remainder in their own, and they became rich. Can you imagine how popular they were in the Warsaw Ghetto? That's exactly what a tax collector was in the Gospel story. That's exactly what Zacchaeus was. It's a protection racket. It's blackmail. You pay up or else I'll get them to shoot you. And everything above the quota goes into my pocket. Now that's the situation. In Jerusalem itself, the high priest and the other priests in the temple, they were in the same racket, but in a rather different way. They had said to the Roman authorities, you can't come into the temple, that is sacred Jewish area. And the temple was the size of 13 English cathedrals, about 13 acres. Huge. And uh, the Romans couldn't go in there. And then the priests hit on this idea. 
you cannot put Roman money in the temple offerings. When the plate goes round, no Roman coins with Caesar's image because God has said, thou shalt not make any graven images. So you can only put money in the collection in the temple that we've made. Temple money. Furthermore, when you want to buy a lamb or even a dove to make a sacrifice for your sins to God, you can't buy with Roman money because that would taint your sacrifice with the image of Caesar. You must use temple money. And so they'd set up in the outer courtyard of the temple dozens of money changers who would change your Roman money into temple money at an exorbitant rate. And you can imagine they were making money hand over fist, those money changers in the temple. Are you beginning to see now why Jesus was crucified? Because one day he was going into that very temple with a whip in his hand and he was going to whip people, money changers, and single-handed clear them out of the temple and the priests saw their income disappear. To do something like that was asking for it. And he did it twice. Once at the beginning of the three years and once right at the end of those three years. You can see how the whole situation was like a powder keg. So we have first the terrorists, the freedom fighters, who wanted to fight and get rid of the Romans and would use all sorts of guerrilla tactics to do so. Then you had the collaborators who cooperated with the Romans, but usually to line their own pockets and to get money. And then you had a religious group. In any situation like this, you get stronger religion. In many parts of the British Empire, you get stronger religion than back in Britain. Many of you must have noticed this. Because when you're under another power, when you haven't got your freedom, religion can be a compensation, religion can be a refuge. But it's more than that. The religious people in Israel, we call them Pharisees, genuinely believed that the reason why God didn't send the Romans packing and why they couldn't get their political freedom was, was because the people were not keeping the laws of God. And when a nation is in trouble, you'll get a religious group coming and saying, you know the reason for this, God's angry with us. And so this third group, the Pharisees, they said, we've got to cut, start keeping the laws of God. Every one of them, in every detail. And so they took the Sabbath law and they wrote another 1,000 regulations about how to keep the Sabbath. Some of them are laughable. A Jew mustn't wear a safety pin in the clothes on the Sabbath because in pushing the pin through, you were sewing, working. You mustn't wear your false teeth on the Sabbath because you're carrying a burden around. And if you go walking on the Sabbath and you have a stick that you need, don't drag it in the dust or you'll leave a line in the dust and that's plowing. And you're breaking the Sabbath. Now, you laugh at this, but it's still in Israel today. If you go in, into a lift in a block of flats, you'll see a little notice. This is a Sabbath lift. And you can actually use it on the Sabbath because the rabbis today say if you switch a light on and off or press an electric button, you're working on the Sabbath. But they've now invented a special switch that doesn't make or break the circuit. It's called a Sabbath switch. And you can use those on the Sabbath. So they're very popular now. But before they were invented, a Jewish family would either leave all the lights on over the weekend... Or else they'd have a Gentile maid to come and do it. They're still at it. They're still trying to keep the law of God. At least they're sincere in trying. But it becomes ridiculous, doesn't it? It becomes what we call legalistic. Now this religious group was saying to the people, no wonder the Romans are still here. You're not keeping the laws of God. We'll show you how to keep them. And yet Jesus upset them too did nothing but upset people. Actually, in three short years, he made more enemies than friends. 
There were people who loved him and who died for him and who followed him. They said they would die for him anyway. They'd follow him. They left their jobs and followed him. But there were others who hated him. And you know, all this started just after he'd been born. I must tell you something else about the Romans, how they controlled a country. They either put in a Roman governor who directly controlled the situation with troops. That was a kind of emergency situation. But normally what they preferred to do was to have a puppet ruler, somebody in their pocket, somebody who would control the people for them, a king whom they'd appointed. And before Christ was born, a man went to Rome and said to the Caesar, I'd like to buy the throne of Israel. And they said, well, will you control the people for us? He said, yes, I'll do that. But he said, I'll pay handsomely if you let me have the throne. His name was Herod. And he was called the Great because he had big ambitions. He had an ambition to build unique buildings, to become famous, and he has done. And he bought the throne of Israel and was given the title by Rome, King of the Jews. But he wasn't a Jew. He was an Edomite, a descendant of Esau. And the Jews said, Jacob is our father, Esau is not. He sold his birthright for a plate of soup. And therefore they would never recognize Herod as their king. He was as much a foreigner as a Roman governor. But Herod had bought the kingdom. And to try and please the Jews, he pulled their temple down and built a much bigger one. And it was still building when Jesus died. In fact, on the night before he died, the disciples said, look at these stones of this temple Herod is building. It took years and years. And I've seen some of those stones. There's one 40 feet long by 3 feet by 3 feet and it weighs a hundred tons and Herod built a temple with stones that big and the disciples on the last night of Jesus' life said look at these stones and Jesus said I tell you not one stone will be left standing on another and you know on my last visit to Israel we saw the fallen stones they found them just a few years ago my wife and I walked along the street that Jesus walked And it was cracked because these great stones had been thrown off the building twice the height of this building and they'd been thrown down and just smashed the street to bits. When Jesus says something's going to happen, it will happen. He was the prophet. Well now, when Herod the Great died, or no, I must just remind you that when Jesus was born, Herod the Great was the first to want to kill him. He didn't want a Jewish king. He believed the promises that there would be. And he was determined that if a baby had been born, who was to be king of the Jews, he wouldn't survive. You don't ever see this on a Christmas card. You don't ever see this in a nativity play at school, do you? The killing of 200 babies. How do you think Mary and Joseph felt Having been warned in a dream, they became refugees. They fled to Egypt with the baby. But how do you think Mary felt that because of her boy, 200 other babies had been slaughtered? You ever thought of that? Do you ever ask questions like that in the Bible? Get the human side of the Bible. But Herod was determined this boy will not live. That was the first attempt to kill Jesus. It may come as a surprise to you that there were many attempts to kill Jesus from the very beginning of his ministry. Just as soon as he went public, people began to plot his death because of the situation. Let's take the next example of when they tried to kill him. His own friends and relatives, his own former customers in the village of Nazareth where he'd made chairs and tables and door frames and window frames, his former customers and his relatives and his friends tried to throw him off the cliff for preaching a sermon they didn't like. Now that's a bit extreme, isn't it? Would you do that? 
If you didn't like my sermon this morning, would you try and throw me off a cliff? It's not the way we behave these days. Which raises an interesting question. Why, after just one sermon, did his own friends and people who had known him for the last 18 years or so as a carpenter, why would they try and kill him? Well, he was the visiting guest and so he was invited to read the Bible. And they gave him the role of the prophet Isaiah. And he opened it and he read from chapter 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. To bring good news to the poor, to set at liberty the captive, to bring freedom. Well, now you'd have thought, they'd have thought, that's a great sermon. On the contrary, it made them terrified. And do you know why? Well, I've told you already. They realized what Jesus was saying. He's saying, I am the king. I am the anointed one. In Greek, I am the Christ. In Hebrew, I am the Messiah. And they realized straight away that if the Roman authorities away there in Jerusalem heard that there was a king or someone claiming to be a king in a little village called Nazareth, the Romans were likely to come and wipe out the village. That's why they tried to kill him. Makes sense now, doesn't it? People were scared stiff for their lives. Well, the next attempt to kill him came in Jerusalem and he was having a discussion on fatherhood with the Jewish leaders. It's a fascinating discussion. It's in John 8 if you want to read it. And it began with the Jews saying a rather nasty thing to Jesus. By the way, the word Jew there means somebody from the south, from Judea. When it says the Jews killed Jesus, it doesn't mean all Jews did doesn't even mean all Israel did. It means the people in the south in Judea did. And the Jews said to Jesus, nasty this, we know who our father is. Already there had been a rumor, you see, that Jesus didn't know who his father was. That Mary was pregnant before Joseph married her. That Jesus was illegitimate. We know who our father is, they said. You don't, do you? Nasty. And Jesus said, yes, I do. God is my father. They said, God is our father. No, no, he said, he isn't. Your father is the devil. <laughs> this is not the way to be a popular preacher. <laughs> you can see how he upset people so easily. How do you know the devil is our father? Because the devil is the father of lies. That's his native language. And you're always telling lies about me. Abraham is our father, they said. Before Abraham was born, I am. Now that's bad grammar. He should have said before Abraham was born, I was. But just a minute, no, he said, I am. And if you know your Bible, that's the name of God. When Moses was called by God to deliver the children of Egypt, he said to, to God, who shall I say called? What's your name? Tell them, I am called you. And immediately it says in John 8, they took up stones to stone Jesus because for a carpenter from Nazareth to call himself God, that's just wicked. And they wanted to stone him to get rid of him because they expected God to come and judge them for even listening to such a man. I had a letter some years ago from Stoke-on-Trent. Dear Mr. Pawson, I've bought one of your tapes thinking you were a gospel singer. <laughs> and I'm very disappointed there's no music at all. But he said, I have listened to the tape and you've been talking about me the whole time. He said, I am the Christ. I have come to save the world. And he went on like that for 14 pages. Good gra grammar, good writing. Here's somebody in Stoke-on-Trent who thinks he's the saviour of the world. What's your reaction to that? Well, my wife read it and shook her head sadly and said, poor man. Well, what would you think about a carpenter from Nazareth? 
saying that. It's like a garage mechanic from Wigan <laughs> claiming to be the Christ. No wonder they tried to stone him. You know, there were at least five attempts to try and kill Jesus from stoning to throwing off a cliff and yet he escaped every time. How he did it, I don't know, just by sheer presence. But he would face the crowd and then he would slip away and they'd fail. But there came a day when Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem knowing how many people he'd upset. Knowing that the Pharisees hated him because he wouldn't observe their Sabbath laws and were already plotting to kill him. Knowing that the priests who were called Sadducees, knowing that they had already lost a lot of money through him. Knowing that the Romans were always watching for anybody who claimed to get a following to bring freedom. Have you got the picture? Where would Jesus fit into the three groups? Where, where would he fit? Well, he didn't fit any of them. He wouldn't fight with the freedom fighters. At times it looked as if he would collaborate because he used to go and have lunch with a tax collector called Zacchaeus. And when they said, should we pay taxes to Caesar? He said, yes. This coin belongs to Caesar, you pay it to him. So was he a collaborator? No. Because Zacchaeus stop defrauding people. And the Sadducees' priests were losing money now in the temple. Would he join the religious group, Pharisees? No. He didn't fit anywhere, but he had a gigantic following. Thousands would do anything for him. And he chose the moment so carefully. It was the first feast in the Jewish calendar, Passover, roughly our Easter, and every male Jew had to go to Jerusalem for the feast. Which means that upwards of two million men went to Jerusalem for the Passover. And of course there would be no accommodation to them, so they camped on the Mount of Olives. And most of those who camped on the Mount of Olives were Galileans from the north. Those among whom Jesus was very popular. Those who had tried to make him king after he'd fed the 5,000. Now can you see? There's a situation coming that is very tense. For the feast of Passover, Pontius Pilate, who was now the Roman governor of part of the Middle East, would come up from Caesarea where he lived to Jerusalem and bring thousands of extra troops. Furthermore, because Romans weren't allowed in the temple, the temple had their own troops, the temple guard. They had their own bouncers their own security guards. And Jerusalem was just as tense as that every time there was a feast. Because here were all these Galileans, thousands upon thousands, camped on the Mount of Olivet. And here are all the other Jews who live in Jerusalem and Judea. They're there too. The place is packed with people. There are soldiers everywhere waiting for a spark to set the mob going. And it was just at that point that Jesus chose to stage a demonstration which could have turned into a riot. And he quite deliberately got on a donkey and rode into Jerusalem. Do you realize that in doing that he was signing his death warrant? He really was. The disciples had already realized it. When he'd said, let's go to Jerusalem for the feast, Thomas said, well, we'll go and die with him. <laughs> Dear old Thomas, the born optimist, <laughs> we'll go and die with him. He could see that if Jesus just showed his face at that feast, he was finished. But to ride in procession, and now we understand what the people said and what they did, when they threw their cloaks in front of the donkey and they waved palms, you must know that that is always the way they greeted a conquering king. They wouldn't do it for anybody else. But a king who was coming to release them, to bring them their freedom again, they'd do it for him. They'd throw their coats down. They'd pull the palm branches off the trees and they would shout, Hoshana! 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 
and we sing, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, as if it's a nice little word. It isn't. It means, liberate us. Save us now. Come on, you can do it. We're with you. Liberate us. It was the cry of the freedom fighters. The Galileans, with their hero Jesus, thought at last he's going to do it. He hasn't fought for three years, but now he's going to do it. We're with you. And they shouted, Hoshana, Hoshana. It's the freedom fighters' cry. And they'd missed it. They had totally misunderstood Jesus. For one thing, they hadn't noticed the donkey. That was terribly important. A king who comes to conquer and to set people free always rides a horse. And usually a white horse. And when Jesus comes back from heaven, he's going to be riding a white horse. But he came the first time on a donkey. Because he was coming in peace. Even the prophets had known that. And they didn't notice that when he got near Jerusalem, he wept. And tears poured down his cheeks. They thought he was so happy that they were following him. But he wasn't. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chickens beneath her wings. And you wouldn't. You wouldn't. Because you see, whereas Jesus had been immensely popular in Galilee in the north, he was just the opposite in Jerusalem in the south. Whenever he'd come, he had crossed people. And he was walking into a trap, riding into a trap. And when he got to the gate, and I have walked on a Palm Sunday two miles from Bethany up to Jerusalem with thousands of pilgrims. I've done that walk on a Palm Sunday in the blazing sun. And as you come up the last hill to the gate, the lion gate, there are lions in the stonework around it. As you come up to that gate, I remembered what Jesus did. He turned left instead of right. And the crowd went quiet. All the way up the hill they'd shouted, Hoshana, Hoshana, set us free. And he turned left. Now, of course, you probably don't know the significance of that. Let me explain. On the right, as you go through the gate, your right was the Roman garrison where Pontius Pilate and his troops were. On the left is the Jewish temple. And Jesus had seen somebody with a, a whip, or maybe he had the whip to keep the donkey going, but he got hold of a whip. Now, of course, they hadn't even noticed that he hadn't got a weapon, not even a sword, but he had got a whip. And he turned left into the temple. And he did it for the second time. And he cleaned the temple out of sheer anger of all the money changes. How dare you turn my father's house into a den of thieves. This was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. As soon as people get near, you take the money off them. It says zeal for God's house ate him up. Now, of course, this was the last straw. The people would now desert him in droves. Because all their hopes were disappointed, Palm Sunday was turning out to be a disaster. Instead of getting rid of the Romans, he's whipping Jews. Can you see now why only a few days later they would shout, crucify him, we want Barabbas. We want the fighter. We want the man who will lead us against the Romans. But this Jesus is useless. He just whips Jews. And for the next few days, Jesus was in among the crowds, still popular, but they were puzzled. When are you going to do it? That's when they asked him about paying taxes to Caesar. They asked him a whole lot of other questions too, through the next few days. But everybody was waiting to see what his next move would be. And the authorities were watching Jesus very carefully. You see, here's a man who's got thousands of followers from up north camping with him. And he's in Jerusalem and 
streets are packed and the soldiers are trying to keep order. The Romans would be watching him to see if he would start a rebellion, a riot. The temple guards were watching him. The priests were watching him to see if he was going to do it again and rob them of all the money over the Passover. They were going to make a fortune. Everybody was watching Jesus. But the temple authorities had a secret meeting and they said, this man has got to go. He's got to die. He could wreck the whole nation. He could take over the temple. He could start riots. It's better for one man to die than that the Romans should destroy all the people. You've heard this kind of argument, isn't it? Was it worthwhile NATO going into Kosovo? They're really helping people. Tense situations, tension in the Middle East. What's the right thing to do? But a popular leader has to be watched very carefully. And so they decided to kill him. But they had two big problems. Problem number one, they couldn't get hold of him. Because he was always surrounded by his popular followers. Always in a crowd. And if they seized him when the crowd was watching, they knew there'd be a riot, the Romans would come and deal with it and many would be killed. So they said, we can't take him in daylight. But where does he spend the night? Nobody knows. He just seems to slip away out of the city and nobody knows where he spends the night. So that was their problem number one. It was going to be solved by one of Jesus' own followers. Because another apostle, Judas, had already realized that the whole thing was heading for disaster. That there was no way that Jesus would get out of this. And Judas was a man who loved money. He was the treasurer for the disciples and it says that he helped himself to the offerings. He is a man who had a weakness. He'd followed Jesus, left his job. He healed in the name of Jesus. He preached the kingdom in the name of Jesus. He'd done all that. But there was a fatal flaw in his character. He loved money too much. And he thought, all this is coming to an end. He said, I've got to get out of it while I can. And Can I get any cash out of it? I've given up three years' employment. Can I make it up in any way? And he thought of the idea. He said, he realized that they wouldn't be able to touch Jesus unless they knew where he was at night on his own. So he went to the authorities. He said, I'll tell you where you can get him. You follow me and I'll kiss him. What a kiss. But he got 30 pieces of silver, which was the price of a slave. So he got something out of it. But after he realized what he'd done, he threw that money back at the people. And he went out and hanged himself. So their first problem was solved. They'd got him. And they went to Gethsemane, where Jesus deliberately stayed within reach. And they'd got him. Now their other problem came, and that was the bigger one. The bigger problem was how to justify it before the people. There was only one way they could do it, and that was to prove publicly that Jesus was guilty of a serious crime. A crime that deserved the death penalty. Only in that way could they justify what they were going to do to their own consciences and to the people. If they could prove to the people that he deserved to die, then the people wouldn't riot. How to do it? So they went through the Jewish law and there are 15 things that deserve the death penalty in the Jewish law. Many of them are sexual crimes. Adultery. He had to be put to death. Fornication. Buggery. Sex with an animal. Jewish law says you must be put to death. Incest, sex with a child, deserves the death penalty. But they couldn't pin a single sexual sin on Jesus. Then there was the sin of idolatry, bowing down to idols and false gods. They couldn't pin that one on Jesus. They are desperate to find a crime in Jewish law that deserves the death penalty, and there's one. Just one that they could pin on him. And it's the charge of blasphemy. The reason why Salman Rushdie is in hiding in London right now is the same law. 
because the Mosaic law and the Muslim law is identical here. Blasphemy, death. And so they got hold of witnesses, this secret trial in the middle of the night. They had to do it quickly to get it all over before the feast began. And so they had a secret trial through the midnight hours and they had witnesses and they asked each of these witnesses, have you ever heard him blaspheme? The problem was that the witnesses couldn't agree. Did he ever say he was God? Well, not exactly. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the resurrection of life. And it, it sounded as if he was using God's name. Oh, and they couldn't get a clear case because Jewish law says two or three witnesses must agree. They couldn't get it. So the judge, the high priest, did an illegal thing. It was illegal in Jewish law as it is in British law to force someone to condemn themselves out of their own mouth. The prisoner is free to keep silent. But the high priest said to Jesus, I adjure you by God. And that's a very strong swearing. I adjure you by God. You've got to answer me. Are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? Are you? And Jesus said, I am. I am. And the high priest tore his clothes. He said, we've got 70 witnesses now because they'd managed to call the whole Sanhedrin, the Jewish council together, 70. And the high priest says, we've got 70 witnesses. You all heard it. You all agree. And they shouted, death, death. Now they had two more problems. The next problem was that the Romans wouldn't let them put anybody to death. Romans had to do it. So they had to go and get hold of Pilate now and get him out of bed early. And Pilate had a good wife. That was the only good thing about him. She must have said, look, if they're this desperate to get this man dead, you're getting into trouble. Anyway, Pilate came. And now they had the second problem. Blasphemy is not a crime in Roman law. It's a crime in Jewish law, but not Roman. So now they had the problem. How to get the Romans to put him to death when he hadn't broken Roman law. So they changed the crime and the charge from blasphemy to treason. Not that he said he was God, but that he said he was the king of the Jews. Now that is against Roman law, because they'd already appointed King Herod and his sons. That's how they got him. And Pilate knew that he was totally innocent. He knew it. But Pilate had a bit of a history. He was a slave once upon a time. And he'd risen. He was a self-made man. Come all the way up from being a slave. But he was a bully. Many ex-slaves can be bullies. And he was one. And he blundered again and again. For example, on one occasion, he wanted to bring a new water supply to Jerusalem and build an aqueduct to bring new water in. And he was short of cash, so he thought, those priests in the temple have a lot of money, I'll borrow it. And he took the temple gifts for God and paid for the water supply. And it caused a riot. And he crucified 3,000 Jews on that occasion. When anybody gave Pilate problem, he just crucified them. That's Pilate. And now he's facing Jesus. Are you a king? You say so. If you knew the truth, said Jesus. Truth? What's truth? And the answer was standing six feet in front of him. Jesus was the truth. And so the trial proceeded and Pilate was getting nowhere at all. So he decided to send him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem for the feast. And Herod was the man who'd killed Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. And when Jesus stood before Herod, he said not a word, nothing to say to him. Do you know the worst thing that can happen to a human being is if Jesus has nothing to say to you. There's no hope for you if Jesus won't speak to you. 
And he wouldn't speak to that fox. He called him that fox. So Herod sent him back to Pilate. Now Pilate tried everything he could to get rid of the problem. First thing he did, I'll have him flogged. And they took Jesus away, stripped off his coat and flogged him to within an inch of his life with a whip that has little metal pellets tied to leather straps that just tears your flesh to bits. And he had him flogged. And the soldiers not only flogged him, they spat on him. They put a crown of thorns. They put a purple robe on him and pushed him back out. And Pilate says, I've flogged him now. And look at him. Object of contempt. He's just a poor, weak man. Look at him. Can I let him go now? Crucify him, crucify him. All right, said Pilate, I'll tell you what I'll do. You know that I give amnesty to a prisoner every feast to please you. I'll give you a choice. Now, here is one of the greatest ironies of history. The man he chose to give them a choice alongside Jesus was called Bar Abbas, but he had a first name called Jesus. And there it is in some of the manuscripts of the Bible. It's there. Jesus Barabbas, the freedom fighter. And Barabbas means son of the father. Isn't that amazing? This freedom fighter was called Jesus, son of the father. And Pilate said, now which of these two would you like me to release? And the crowd said, the one that will fight. This Jesus, no use to us. We thought he was going to be and he's a disappointment. We'll have that one. Barabbas was the first man to live because Jesus died. But he was the first of millions. Finally, Pilate said, I'll wash my hands of this man. It's none of my business. You can do with him what you like. Or we want him crucified. All right, take him away and do it. But I wash my hands of him. Pilate didn't realize that his name would go down into history. Wherever the Christian faith has gone, people have had a creed about their faith, which has included the names of two human beings, the woman who brought him into the world and the man who put him out of it. Conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead and buried. Pilate is world famous. And you know what probably happened to him? He blundered again and again and finally he was deposed and he built himself a seaside bungalow to retire to in a little town called Pompeii. And in AD 79, <laughs> you know what happened, it was on the television last night. Pompeii, Pilate. Well, they took him. I must hurry on. They crucified him at nine o'clock in the morning and strung him up stark naked. They processed him through the streets carrying the cross, his arms tied to the cross beam so that when he fell, he fell on his face, couldn't protect himself. A black man picked up the cross. He was compelled to carry it one mile under Roman law. And you know that man became the father of Rufus and Alexander, two lovely Christian boys, and became a preacher. Fascinating, isn't it? So they came to Golgotha, the hill that looks like a skull, and they nailed him, nine o'clock in the morning. He hung there for six hours. For the first three hours, he was concerned about other people. And it was quite light, wasn't too bad at first. And so Jesus was concerned about other people. He was concerned about the soldiers who were gambling for his clothes. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't realize. They don't know they're trying to kill your son. They were guilty of a crime, a dreadful crime. It's called deicide. To kill God. They didn't realize. Forgive them. I believe they were forgiven. I don't believe Jesus had an unanswered prayer. And then he was concerned about his mother. She'd had 
agony all her life over Jesus. She'd known what was coming. Because as a little baby, when she'd taken him into the temple, an old man had seen that baby Jesus and said, Lord, I can die happy. I've seen him. The king's come. But he said to the mother, but a sword will pierce your heart. It won't be fun being a mother of this boy. And so on the cross, Jesus said to the only disciple who was still there, John, I want you to look after my mum. John, your mother. Mother, that's your son now. And it says that John took her away that minute so she didn't see her son die. He took her home. And then he was concerned also about a criminal alongside him. A dying murderer on a cross by his side. And this dying thief, we call him, he was worse than that. This man looked at Jesus and he said to his other colleague on the other cross, he said, you know, we deserve this. This man doesn't. He's done nothing wrong. <laughs> Lord, and he looked at the notice above Jesus' head because they used to put the crime on a placard above their heads on the cross. A little label would say murderer, thief, adulterer, whatever. But the crime of Jesus, the king of the Jews. And they'd said to Pilate, no, you mustn't write that. You must write, he said he was the king of the Jews. No, said Pilate, what I've written, I've written. The one little burst of courage he showed. And this man read that and he said, I believe you are a king and I believe you will come and you will bring the kingdom. Now to say that to a dying man on a cross, that's faith. He said, I just ask one thing. When you get your kingdom, will you find a place in it for me? Jesus said, today we'll be together. Today, not some distant future today Amen. and then at 12 o'clock the whole scene changed and Jesus became more concerned about himself he'd been concerned about others but now the suffering was getting worse the sky went black thick thick cloud blotted out the sun and it went as dark as midnight and then Jesus said I'm thirsty well, you would be. And they teased him by giving him vinegar to drink. That just makes him more thirsty. It doesn't quench your thirst at all. They offered him myrrh, which is a kind of drug to dull the pain, and he refused that. He wasn't going to dull the pain, but he was thirsty. And then he cried out, my God, my God, why? Why? Did you ever cry that out? Did, did you ever wonder where God was when things were going terribly wrong? Where was God when the Jews were being put in the gas chambers at Auschwitz? Where is God now with all the refugees in Kosovo trying to save their lives? Where is God? What's he doing? Why? Why do you let it happen, God? Well, if ever that question was asked, it was when Jesus hung on the cross. And he felt that God had left him all alone. Sheer loneliness. I'll tell you tonight what he was feeling. And finally he cried out, It's finished. It's over. It's over. Again, we'll look at that again tonight and ask, What did he mean? What was over? What was finished? What was complete? And then his very last word, the seventh thing he said from the cross, was a prayer that he'd learned at his mother's knee years and years ago because every Jewish mother teaches a, a Jewish child to say a good night prayer before they go to sleep it's a verse from Psalm 31 verse 6 and the prayer is into your hands I commit my spirit and Jesus remembered a prayer from his mother's knee he only added one extra word Father Abba Dad into your hands I commit my spirit and he was gone. He had actually said, nobody will take my life from me. 
I will lay it down. I'll decide. He wasn't the victim. Again, as we shall see tonight. Well, that's the story of his death. There's one more thing to add that begins to touch the mystery of why he died, how he died. The bodies had to be taken down before the Sabbath began, which was only three hours after he died, which would be at 6 p.m. And so Pilate ordered the soldiers to make sure the bodies really were bodies, that the people were dead. And so they came and smashed the legs of the two thieves. And they died so quickly. They came to Jesus. And he looks as if he's dead already, hanging there. But to make sure, one of the soldiers pushed a spear under his ribs into his heart. That was the quickest way to make absolutely sure. So, up under the ribs, right into the heart with the spear. And John saw what happened next. It is the most extraordinary thing. Out of his side, there gushed, it says, there gushed a copious flow of blood followed by another flow of water. And John has recorded that. He said, I was there. I saw it. But not until this century do we understand what it means. It's a most unusual thing to happen. Very, very rare. It means that Jesus died of a ruptured pericardium. Or in simple English, he died of a broken heart. It was his heart that killed him, not the cross. And tonight I'm going to tell you what broke his heart, because that's what he died of after only six hours on the cross. Well, I must draw the threads together for this morning. I've taken a bit longer than I will take other meetings, but I just wanted to go through this story with you because I wanted you to see that it was real, that it happened, why it happened. And if Jesus hung on the cross for six hours, then a congregation can think about it for a bit longer than 20 minutes. Some people have three-hour services on Good Friday to watch with Jesus. And Jesus said to the disciples in Gethsemane, could you not watch with me one hour? But I must draw to a close. What's your reaction to this story? There are four possible reactions at the human level. Number one, indifference. Couldn't care less. As I drove here, there were just hundreds of cars driving out on the M3. Our side was clear. The other side was packed with cars. I thought, where are you all going? Don't you care? This is a holy day, not a holiday. You wouldn't have a holiday if Jesus hadn't died. Don't you care? Are you so indifferent that your only concern today is where shall we go and what shall we do and how shall we enjoy ourselves? Don't you care? Is it only a handful of people on this single estate? How many on this estate are caring about this story? Or just indifferent to it? And I couldn't help thinking of a poem that I learned years ago. A poem called Indifference, written by a Reverend Studdard Kennedy, who was a chaplain in World War I and known as Woodbine Willie because he used to give Woodbine cigarettes to the soldiers. He was vicar at St. Martin in the Fields in Trafalgar Square at one time. And this was his poem. When Jesus came to Golgotha, they hanged him on a tree. They drove great nails through hands and feet and made a calvary. They crowned him with a crown of thorns. Red were his wounds and deep. For those were crude and cruel days. And human flesh was cheap. When Jesus came to Birmingham, they simply passed him by. They wouldn't hurt a hair of him. They only let him die. For men had grown more tender. And they wouldn't give him pain. They only just passed down the street and left him in the rain. Still Jesus cried, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
And still it rained the wintry rain that drenched him through and through. The crowds went home with not a soul to see that Jesus crouched against a wall and cried for Calvary. The indifference that people should get so upset about Stephen Lawrence and James Hamratty and not bother about the greatest injustice there has ever been in history. Indifference is not the wrong attitude, but then you are not indifferent. You've come here this morning. Second possibility is just to be interested. It is an interesting story, and the more you study it, the more interesting it gets, and, and the more you see parallels to situations today where foreigners are occupying lands that don't belong to them, and freedom fighters are saying, we'll fight for freedom, whatever it costs. It, it's a very interesting story. Indifference, interest. The third possibility is indignation. I hope that as I've talked, you did feel a bit of anger. Why? Didn't you feel that it was so unjust, so unfair, so wrong, that such a good person had done nothing but good? should be judicially murdered after only three years. Didn't you have some sense of protest in you? How about pressing the world to a retrial of Jesus? Why not open up the case again? In fact, that's what I'm doing this weekend. I'm opening up the case again so that every one of you can give your verdict. Did this man deserve to die? But there's a fourth attitude. Those who hear this story and feel involved in it, not indifferent to it, not just interested in it, not just indignant about this injustice, but involved. Just ask yourself this question, where would you have been in all that? Yes. You'd have been somewhere. Where would you have been? Who do you identify with when you hear the story? Why at best would you have been one of the, his own disciples and friends who fled in case they got nailed to a cross? Where would you have been? Tonight I'm going to show you actually that you were very involved. You were actually there. It's not just where would you have been if you'd been there. In a very real sense, you were there. And you're either there as someone who is to blame for his death or you're actually on the cross with him and have been crucified with Christ. You see, this story, it's 2,000 years away and 2,000 miles away, but it is our story in a very real way. We are all involved in it. We can't escape from it. But you can only see how involved you are when you look at all this story from a different angle. I've only looked at it this morning from the human angle and showed you how inevitable it was in that situation that Jesus would be crucified. But there's a divine angle. And I leave you now with these two questions. First, why did Jesus let it happen? He could have escaped. He'd escaped every other time when they tried to kill him. He could have stepped off that cross as easily as I talk to you now. The power that raised the dead, the power that caused the blind to see and the lame to walk, that power could have got him off the cross. But he refused to use it. Even when they laughed at him and said, you saved everybody else, now save yourself. Why did he stay? Why did he let himself be killed? And the second, even bigger question, why did God do nothing? Why didn't God stop this dreadful travesty of justice? Why didn't God rescue his son? Again, the crowd said, let's see, when they heard him cry, my God, my God, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why? They said, let's see if God comes to help him. No. Then he can't be God's son. Why did God leave his son alone? 
Why did he just leave the situation? Because there's no question God was not there. He'd left. Why? Well, then we'll begin to understand very much more about the cross. And I hope you'll come back tonight to hear the rest of the story. Meanwhile, I'm going to dare to sing you just one verse of a song. I heard it yesterday on a tape by that wonderful black singer, Paul Robeson. And this was the song. Give me a note. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Paul Robeson sang that song. And somebody shouted out, yes, we were all there. Let's pray.